Jurassic World Dominion is the thrilling conclusion to the second Jurassic trilogy, but it doesn't wrap everything up into a neat bow. What's the villain's ultimate plan? What's next for Dr. Wu? Keep watching for the biggest unanswered questions in Dominion. By the end of Jurassic World Dominion, the governments of the world have decided that the remaining dinosaurs under Biosyn's care will continue living in the valley in Italy's Dolomite Mountains, which will become a natural preserve for the animals. This comes, of course, after Biosyn's fall from grace, leaving the land free and available. What the film doesn't address, however, is exactly how the preserve will be maintained in the context of all the other dinosaurs out in the world. Biosyn was keeping their own stock of creatures on hand, sure, and the surviving dinos will be free to stay there, but what does that mean for the wild dinosaurs who've adapted to whatever climate they've settled in at this point? Will world governments designate special teams to round up those dinosaurs and resettle them in the preserve? Will some dinosaurs simply be allowed to roam the wild forever as part of a larger mission of coexistence? Whether fans get a sequel or not, the implications of this preserve in the larger franchise story are fascinating. Midway through Dominion, it is revealed that Maisie Lockwood is not just a clone of the late Charlotte Lockwood, but actually her daughter, born through a means of asexual reproduction, with her genetic code corrected from Charlotte's to eliminate a congenital defect. Maisie is, therefore, the key to a puzzle involving Biosyn's swarms of genetically engineered super locusts, because her DNA could help create a pathogen that kills them. Maisie's importance throughout Dominion is well established, but what viewers still don't know is what other applications her unique genetic makeup might offer. Her brilliant mother was able to create her through genetic manipulation alone, which could open up new reproductive avenues for infertile women. Her unique DNA could also give scientists clues to curing any number of diseases. So is Maisie the Rosetta Stone for all manner of cures? Could the wonder of her existence be replicated? Is she destined to be studied for the rest of her life all in the name of saving more people? It's up in the air, but by the time the film ends, Maisie is in the unique position of being the most valuable human being on the planet. You shouldn't use my name. Dodson! Dodson! We've got Dodson here! Jurassic World Dominion recasts and reintroduces the villainous Lewis Dodgson, played by Campbell Scott this time around. Dodgson is a longtime rival of John Hammond, who has now made his company, Biosyn, the biggest corporate presence in the dinosaur realm. With the help of Dr. Henry Wu, Dodgson has set up a state-of-the-art facility devoted to studying dinosaurs and their DNA. He's also, in secret, developing super locusts to devour crops around the world, with the goal of selling his own company's seeds as a locust-proof alternative. This plan backfires, of course, and by the end of the film, Dodgson is dead and his company has been exposed as corrupt. Viewers know that various major players in the film, including Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler, are set to tell both Congress and the press about Biosyn's issues, but the question remains, what else was Dodgson working on? He was ambitious and ruthless enough to mess with food supplies after all, so what about water supplies? What about invasive plant species to alter other ecosystems to suit his needs? The film digs deep into the problems of Biosyn, but it's also clear by the end that we've only scratched the surface of Dodgson's schemes. At one point late in the film, Dr. Henry Wu approaches the heroes and asks them for help, only to have Dr. Ian Malcolm point out that, historically, Wu has been at least one of the sources of every problem in the franchise. All of this exists because of me. The legendary geneticist has had his hand in engineering just about every dangerous dino species walking the Earth at this point, so why should they trust him? Well, it turns out that Wu might be the only guy who can stomp the Locust Plague, so they give him a hand. He stops the Locust Plague, and it all works out. But Wu still deserves some sort of consequences for his role doesn't he? This is a guy who spent years designing dinosaurs by fusing their DNA with various reptiles and who has now spent at least the last little while designing custom killer locusts for Biosyn. At best, he's a dangerous man who needs to be disbarred, restricted, ostracized, and or stopped from further experimentation. At worst, he's a criminal who should be locked away, regardless of whether he's learned his lesson and despite how charming and quirky B.D. Wong makes the character, Wu has to own up to some of those sins. The question is, how? 
By the time of Dominion, dinosaurs have spread out around the globe, inhabiting just about every continent in some form or another and becoming either a nuisance or an outright hindrance to human life. Some see this as an opportunity, and they are manipulating things for their own gain. Biosyn is front and center, of course, but there are hints other people are custom breeding dinosaurs to make them into killing machines, with poachers picking up dinosaurs for breeding purposes to sell as pets, or worse. By the end of the film, there's a concerted effort to create a new sanctuary for the creatures, but that doesn't mean the poachers and the breeders are just going to go away. The question is, how many of them are still out there? And how far will they go in order to protect their hustle? Speaking of those breeders, it's clear in Dominion that certain aspects of dinosaur-adjusted life from Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom have only grown in the intervening years. Early in the film, we meet Santos, played by Dechan Lockman. Santos is a bounty hunter of sorts who has been tasked with getting her hands on Maisie for Dodgson and Biosyn. In the course of her mission, Santos introduces us to a group of specially bred raptors trained to target anything identified by a laser pointer and hunt it. These raptors have a relatively small role to play in the overall film, but their presence reminds us that various interests around the world are still devoted to making sure dinosaurs can be deployed as powerful weapons, something those rich, powerful people in Fallen Kingdom were keenly interested in. What are you doing? This animal is not for sale. If you want to create an addict, you have to give him a taste. The question now, under the new status quo at the end of the film, is how far that effort will go? Will we eventually see mercenaries and even standing armies fighting alongside dinosaurs? Will larger carnivores be drafted into hunting duty? Will herbivores become beasts of burden? The longer dinosaurs exist in our world, the more likely such possibilities seem. Although they have continued to work with dinosaurs on their own in the years since Fallen Kingdom, Claire and Owen begin Dominion living in relative seclusion, doing their best to help out while devoting a lot of energy to taking care of Maisie and keeping her existence a secret. The film's early scenes show us that they're struggling as her adoptive parents, not just because she's rebellious, but because they've been thrown into the roles and are still doing their best to adjust. By the end of the film, both Claire and Owen have grown into their parental roles with Maisie. They've embraced their need to protect her in a more emotional way and pushed themselves to new heights in their journey to get her back no matter what. They've also spent even more time around dinosaurs and proven instrumental to dismantling Biosyn. So what do they do now? Will they keep working with dinosaurs in a more direct way, training some of them while advocating for the safety and care of others? Will Claire's administrative gifts come back into play now that there's a sanctuary devoted entirely to dinosaurs? Will they finally get to take a break when it's clear that Maisie is no longer in danger? Whatever their future may hold, it's clear that life in hiding isn't necessarily something they have to deal with any longer. The most anticipated Dominion element, perhaps, was a reunion of the original Jurassic Park stars, marking the first time in three decades that Grant, Sattler, and Malcolm were all sharing the screen together. It's a big deal, and that proved especially true when it came to the development of Alan and Ellie's long-dormant relationship. By the end of Dominion, Alan and Ellie have once again been on a massive dinosaur-filled adventure together, and their respective single statuses mean there's nothing in the way of a romantic reconciliation. At last, Alan Grant seems willing to settle down with the woman he loves, and Ellie is open to the kind of wandering life Alan's embraced for so long. It makes them a seemingly perfect pairing. So. What happens now? Obviously, they're both going to do some work with Congress to make sure another Biosyn can't emerge from the ashes of the film, but what's after that? Will they go back to full-on paleontology, digging up dead dinosaurs rather than studying live ones? Will they keep traveling the world or settle in one place for a quieter study? Wherever they go, it's clear they'll be together. You coming or what? A lot has changed in the time since the original Jurassic Park film, but one thing that has not is the philosophical outlook of Dr. Ian Malcolm. A naysayer who was convinced the Dinosaur DNA Project was a bad idea from the very beginning, Malcolm has spent the last three decades being proven right time and again. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Now, in Dominion, he's taken a job as a corporate philosopher at Biosyn just for the hefty paycheck it provides, and is more than happy to lecture everyone about the oncoming collapse of human civilization. 
In Ian's eyes, our species has brought about the mechanism of its own extinction, so there's really nothing left to do but rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. By the end of Dominion, however, there seems to be at least the appearance of hope in the world. Dr. Wu has used his genetic prowess for good, the dinosaurs are protected, and the chance of peaceful coexistence seems imminent. With all that in mind, it's worth asking, has Dr. Malcolm's view of the world changed? Did his speech about the power of genetic manipulation and wielding it wisely make him think that perhaps the right people are finally in charge? Or is he still convinced we're all doomed? Over the course of the film, Maisie Lockwood goes on a journey of self-discovery in which she learns that she's far more than just a copy of another person. She's not a clone, at least not exactly, but rather a daughter of a real mother who not only gave birth to her, but advanced her genetic code to give her a better chance at a full life. The more Maisie learns who her mother was and what she was able to do, the more she feels like she knows herself, and the more she feels like she has a life worth living. The question now is, what does Maisie do next? She's still interested in working with Dr. Wu, at least to the extent that she helped solve the locust problem, so will she want to keep doing that work in the future? Will she follow in her birth mother's footsteps and become a brilliant scientist with an eye towards solving the problems of the future? Will she pursue a different field entirely? The possibilities seem endless, but it's clear that Maisie has a much deeper sense of self than she did as the film began. Here's one for the longtime Jurassic Park fans. Near the end of Dominion, as Lewis Dodgson realizes his plans are crumbling, he packs up his data and beats a path out of town on a Hyperloop train. At one point, he reaches for a battered, dirty old Barbasol shaving cream can and puts it with the rest of his things. Fans will recognize this as a nod to his appearance in the original Jurassic Park film, as played by Cameron Thor, when the character gave Nedry a Barbasol can, hollowed out to hold vials for dinosaur embryos as part of his plan to steal Hammond's cloning tech. 750. On delivery, 50,000 more for each viable embryo. That's 1.5 million if you get all 15 species off the island. It's a nice nod to the original film, but how did Dodgson get the can back in the first place? In Jurassic Park, it's seemingly lost when Nedry is attacked by a dino and left to die. Was there some sort of tracking device in it that meant Dodgson could eventually find it? Did someone just happen across it and figure out it was his? However he came to possess it once again, it's clear that little Ken has been through a lot. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.